Aviva Hosek, there she is. Uh, hi. But you know how we have uh, the uh, prototypical back room policy wonk, but she did come out into uh, the open. She had a stint as a Minister of Housing in the David Peterson government. That's right. Uh, but now she has a new incarnation. She's the new president of the Canadian Institute of Applied Research, which means advanced research, advanced research yes. applied and advanced research, which means you deal with some of these scientific minds and want to yes. encourage them. Tell us more, please. Thank you very much, Moses. Um, I must say it's amazing to be associated, even in terms of being the same intellectual space with some of the people that we've heard this morning and. What I was thinking about before I came here was, um, this is what I've been worrying about for a while, about the space for creativity, both artistic and scientific, both in Canada and through Canada. And the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, which I'm currently um, the president of, is about uh, using Canadian space so that within it, we both um, encourage and enable the very highest quality research in areas of intellectual risk and creativity. And through it, we enable Canadians to be linked to some of the most exciting thinkers in the world so that together they can do things they might otherwise not be able to do. But I imagine my conversation with you today in a way as a series of things I've been thinking about and also cast in the mode of an implicit conversation with some of the people who spoke here yesterday and today. And so I want to start with um, the things that Michael Adams made me think about yesterday. You remember he said that Canadians are distinguished from the rest of the people in both Western Europe and the United States by uh, being the least likely to agree with the proposition that the father is master of the house. Um, and I have been thinking about that for a while because Michael and I have talked about that in the past. And, uh, I also want to remind you that he said that cultural convergence is not inevitable uh, for countries like Canada and others in the world, and that globalization may in fact enhance the differences between countries rather than, rather than decrease them. So thinking about this question and the degree to which Canadians disagree with the notion that the father is master of the house, I asked myself if Michael had tried the following idea. The mother is the master of the house. I don't think he would have received a very large number of people agreeing with that idea either. So it seems to me that the thing that <laughs> distinguishes Canadians here, even more than Europeans, though we saw that the trend for Europeans also was to disagree with the notion of the father as master of the house, I think what is being rejected there is the idea of any single person being the master of the house. And perhaps even the idea that houses need masters in quite that way. The master as someone who is in control. Yesterday it was talked about in terms of patriarchal control, control of men. But my own thinking, thinking about this is that really what's being rejected is the notion of control and mastership. And that we no longer think of houses and homes in this way. It's not that we're substituting one person for another. We don't like the paradigm of the master at all. And um, I think that what this is about is a different attitude to power and a different attitude to control. And I am extremely cheered by the fact that Canadians seem to be the most likely to reject this notion of mastership. Because power can be control, in particular control of other people, or I think it can be the capacity to live without needing to control the other. And my own understanding of creativity is that it's about the ability to um, not need to control, but to in fact experience, experiment, and think without the need for mastery. Because all of us who are listening to the people talking about space today understand that if you can imagine, and now we can show, um, that we live on a planet that someday will no longer be inhabited, the time scales of the universes are completely um, incommensurate with the space of a single human lifetime, or the time of a single human lifetime. The fantasy of control is clearly just that, a fantasy. We don't live in a universe we can control, and perhaps the desire to do that 
has stopped us from learning many of the things that we're capable of learning and building the kind of lives I think most of us would actually like to live. Now, my own feeling is that Canadians have gotten used to not having power or control, and we sometimes bemoan that. But my own view is this is one of our greatest opportunities and one of our greatest strengths. We don't have the desire to control other people's behavior perhaps as much as others, maybe because we haven't had the opportunity to. And um, I think it also has to do with Canada being a non-revolutionary society. Uh, we were founded by, at least on the European side, uh, the, the European founders of Canada rather than the Aboriginal ones, uh, were explicitly anti-revolutionary. We are, the French people in Canada are the ones who did not experience the French Revolution. The, speak, the people of English ancestry in Canada are many of them the people who ran away from the American Revolution to come here and explicitly not to be revolutionary. And I think what that means is that we have resisted the, the Jacobinism, the, the control of people's behavior to create revolutionary persons that other more revolutionary cultures have had, including the culture of uh, the nation to, uh, to our immediate south, which of course was born in revolution and has a very strong sense of what it is to be American and what it means for others to be Americans. I think that um, Canadians don't have that sense of themselves, and I, I consider it, in a way, a peculiar kind of privilege not to have it. Um, I remember a trip um, I took with my husband more than 10 years ago to Barcelona. It was a personal holiday, and we met um, a woman who is a researcher and a scholar at Madrid who ran the Canadian Studies program. And my reaction to the fact that she existed, much less to talking with her, was, why are you interested in Canada? And she said, it's because I think it's the first truly postmodern society. And I said, what do you mean by that? Because having come from an English department, I had my own views of what postmodern was supposed to be. <laughs> and what she said was, Canadians seem to be able to build good lives without having a crisp self-definition or sense of what Canadian identity is, with um, no self-defining myth, no single one, that is the story of all of us, but rather a multiplicity, a multiplicity of such stories, a capacity to tolerate this kind of multiplicity, to have people of many different identities and cultures and backgrounds live next to each other, and for all of them to have potentially multiple rather than single identities, and not to have to choose between them, to have multiple points of consciousness, and an enhanced ability uh, that I think I took from this it seems to me that we, this gives us an enhanced ability to live with both multiplicity and uncertainty, doubt, error, lack of clarity, and perhaps even anxiety, which can go together with those. Um, and I think that, in a way, that describes the real world now, but I think it's a world in which Canadians have lived longer than anyone else. So we may be able to show the world how to live in that kind of space, a space in which there isn't clarity or certainty, there isn't a single way to think about things, there isn't a single person to be, there isn't a single way to be who one is. And you know, I listened yesterday, and I can tell you that I saw examples of that in so many of the interesting things that we saw yesterday and the interesting people that we saw yesterday. In the Cirque du Soleil, which has managed to reinvent a very, very old artistic form by borrowing and patching together the strengths of various things to create an entirely new thing. And in the description that Andrew Watson gave us of the joy of being in the circus, which is a place in which people from very different backgrounds who may not share a single language actually communicate, work together, and create something new. In Laris and John yesterday, who described her ability and her experiment with modern PR techniques and videos and uh, the sexualized selling of things applied to the purpose of giving people who otherwise might not have thought they were interested in it access to classical music. And Dave Bedini, who simultaneously is um, you know, knowledgeable about and passionate about hockey and rock music and thinks about both of them at the same time and writes about hockey and writes about music and makes music. There's no either or there. There's no, what are you really, a hockey fan or a musician? No one thinks to ask the question. And no one in the audience that I talked to yesterday wanted him to tell us that he was one or the other. He was both and. And I think of that as quintessentially a kind of postmodern consciousness, 
But I also believe, and I don't know if I'm right, I simply believe it, that Canada is a place in which more people are allowed to be like that, both in cultural terms and in terms of what it is that they engage with. Let me give you more examples. Yesterday, Anita Kuntz, who was the artist, the magazine artist, who said very interestingly that she wanted to be in the flow as an artist. She wanted to be part of a conversation. She wanted to be part of a dialogue. And if you remember some of her pictures, they were not only powerful emotionally, but they were powerful intellectually because they consisted in many cases of kind of visual and conceptual puns, but they were not arcane and hard to, to read. As soon as you saw them, you got them. They were very rich, but they were actually very conceptual at the same time. The, the various prehistoric Elvis sightings is one example I might be able to remind you of. Or Adam and Eve is imagined by Charles Darwin. Very interesting pictures. Robert Lantos yesterday talked about the desire to deal with films with specifics of history and character. And I know I had a conversation with Robert before Sunshine was um, released, and I was lucky enough to see it early because the other part of my family is Hungarian, talk about multiple identities. And um, I remember seeing the film and loving it, seeing it with my mother, who really knows Hungarian literary history, and, and Robert expressing a fear that perhaps only you know, a series of wacko Hungarian Jews could possibly care about this movie. And I can see why one would have that fear, and yet, of course, that isn't true. The specificity of a particular place, particular history, speaks to people because we reach beyond our own and narrow selves. All of us do, through the process at the very least of empathy. So I, think, I thought yesterday the same thing about Robin Allen, who was presented to us as someone who, in one part of her life, was a financier and a business person. Another part of her life was a dancer and someone who expressed very explicitly the desire to integrate all the various parts of herself and not to have to choose between things. She said she, want, she thinks she, that we want a way to go after our dreams and go beyond having to make trade-offs, which is a version of what she said yesterday that I wrote down. Again, the same thing, a desire not to have to choose. Talk about Moses invented in the, C in the city TV a format which is clearly exportable because it's not rigid. Why can't someone in Bogota with a completely different uh, set of life crises and issues to deal with than people in countries luckier, or cities luckier like our own, why can they use the city TV format? Because it's a format which gives dignity to the local and brings to the foreground the things that are usually hidden about the flow of production and the, and the sort of uh, distinction between the back of the stage and the front of the stage is no longer maintained. It's integrated and there's a kind of flow which assumes an ability to accept the messiness involved in making television as part of what you watch when you watch television. And it's affordable, I think, for a reason. So my, my sort of thesis to myself is that Canada has lived in postmodern space longer than any other country that we have been globalized by being on the receiving end of the mass communications and commodity culture around us longer than anyone, and with the most porous of boundaries, in particular because our language is shared with, most of our language is shared with the language of uh, the people who create much of that mass culture. We have been decentered and marginalized both by our own elites who don't necessarily believe in what we're capable of, and by a series of cultures and countries that saw themselves as the center. France is the center, or Britain is the center, or the United States is the center, by which definition we must be the margin. And I think we've been globalized in another way by having basically taken within ourselves <coughs> the entire world. You have only to walk down the street, at least in the major cities of Canada, and you will see the world. And we are it, and it is inside us. And in that sense, the world is already inside Canada, and yet we've been able to live in that world extremely well. And I would say that, now I confess I'm a person for whom the glass is always half full, but I confess that for me, um, the reaction that I see around us is remarkably unanxious and that the energy is always on the margins, it's always on the edges of things. And one of the things I love about the organization that I'm, that I'm lucky enough to be part of now, in which, though I'm not a scientist, I see myself as the enabler of other people's scientific work is that um, it is on the margin creativity happens or can happen, and it's out of the linkage of people working in areas in which they define things in a new way and don't yet know what they think. 
They're in the space of exploration rather than certainty. They're able to tolerate what uh, Diane Francis yesterday called failure, what I would call error, from which one recovers to try again. And um, it is out of that that new forms of connectedness for both creativity in arts and in science are created. In Canadian Institute for, excuse me, for Advanced Research, these new forms of connectedness are basically a process of joint learning and joint exploration. And um, a part of the great success of this organization, which I have found when I arrived there, so it has nothing to do with me, it was there before, it's been there for almost 20 years, is uh, this ability for people to work together across disciplines to try and solve intellectual problems, to inter interact with each other, and it takes time to build such a culture, to interact with each other, not where they're sure, but where they don't know. To find ways to talk to each other, not in a way that is already comfortable for an internal coterie, but that involves breaking down what they know in order to translate it into the language of another person who knows other things so that together they can answer questions they might not otherwise be able to answer. There is no single human being ever able to know what we need to know, and certainly in the world and time of distributed intelligence, it is the only way we're actually going to proceed is through the sharing of learning and knowledge and helping each other learn things we might never have been able to learn alone. So CIR explores the margins of current knowledge and creates new spaces and new opportunities. It also creates a culture of collaboration that enables the people working in, in that space to feel, as they say to us, that they are in their real intellectual community and um, with their real partners in the process of exploration. Now, I think that everybody who spent a day and a few hours here already understands the, the high that comes from being enabled to be, have a glimpse of what it is that other people are learning and other people are beginning to understand about the world. And I, I certainly feel extremely grateful to Jamie Matthews, to uh, Václav Smil, to the various people we heard yesterday who gave me a glimpse of things that I knew only a little bit about. And of course, their task in each case was to find a language which was a bridge between their much more detailed knowledge and what it is that we, who don't have any specialized knowledge, are able to understand. There's a high involved with that. I think all of us have been having a wonderful time because, and I guess this is part of the optimism that has always driven me, I think human beings are passionate about learning if they are given an opportunity to do so in an environment which honors them and their ignorance, the things they don't know that they are prepared to learn about. Um, and I have to say that I'm thinking about my own country, which of course matters to me a very great deal, I think that um, the current cultural and historical moment in Canada is particularly fruitful because we have begun to make peace with the fact that we are ourselves rather than not some other place. And we are beginning to express to ourselves in a variety of ways what it is that ourselves is. And part of that is, at least in my understanding of it for myself, an ability to tolerate not being at the center and not thinking that the center is the only place to be. Thank you.